Ladies and gentlemen, there are just some prophecies that simply will not go away. There are prophecies that have been foretold for a long, long time, and we have been able to anticipate their fulfillment for a long, long time. But we find ourselves growing ever closer. I mean, it's almost like, to give a very simple example, Noah being told there was a flood coming. And he built on the ark every day, every day, every day for 100 years. But because the flood didn't come, did not mean it wasn't coming. It just simply meant that the ark wasn't ready and the time hadn't come. So everything was coordinated. Well, that's what we're going through right now. We have an incredible prophecy, possibly the most important prophecy since the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that is that a peace agreement in the Middle East is coming. The political powers are working on it almost every day. It's almost like the beach ball that's beyond the fingertips. You think you've got it, and then it goes away again. Uh, I was looking at an interesting article uh, that was just published maybe two or three days ago. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian president, said Arab world was wrong to reject the 1947 partition plan. Now, let me back up and make sure you understand what that is. After World War II, the Jews had no place. Hitler had killed six million of them. The world was racked by guilt. The Jewish people were lobbying for a homeland. They said, we want to go back to our promised land. Well, many of the people making the decisions were Bible-based people. They believed in the Bible. They knew that was the promised land. And at that time, the territory called Israel was very sparsely populated. So the British, who were, had the mandate over it at the time, got together with the United Nations and said, I think this is a good idea. Now, this, this has been developing for 50 years, because way back in 1917, Lord Balfour issued the Balfour Declaration from Britain, stating that all of the Promised Land should go to Israel. Now, the Territory had been under the Ottoman Empire prior, prior to World War I, but when Great Britain won World War I, then everything in the Middle East went over to the British mandate. So Britain ruled over the area until 1945, 46. Finally, they ended their mandate voluntarily in 1948. They said, this is more trouble than it's worth. We're getting out of here. As a matter of fact, they finished their mandate on May 14, 1948, which is what triggered Israel declaring Israeli independence on May 14, 1948, because Britain was moving out, leaving a vacuum, and it would left them at the mercy of their Arab neighbors. And there were 600,000 Jewish people, and there were 42 million Arabs. And so Israel actually made a preemptive move here and said, we are now declaring statehood already. Uh, the United Nations in 1947 had accepted the partition plan. The partition plan made Israel smaller than it ended up after the 1948 war. Uh, it was a smaller pl uh, plot of ground. So the United Nations gave a certain amount to Israel. They gave a certain amount to the Palestinians. But the Palestinians rejected the partition plan. I said, we'll have none of it. We don't want an Israeli entity here in the Middle East at all. So when Israel declared independence on May the 14th of 1948, the very next day, the Arab world launched a full-scale war against the nation of Israel. Well, that war raged on for the next 12 months or so. When a ceasefire was declared in 1949, uh, Israel actually had gained territory, even though she was totally outmanned and outgunned. It was it was a miracle, that's all you can say about it. Uh, she gained territory to the areas called the 1949 uh, uh, ceasefire lines, or you might want to say the 1967 borders. It's the same thing. So the ceasefire, for, ceasefire lines of 1949 held until 1967 when uh, Ab Abu Gabdul Gamal Nasser, the head of Egypt, decided he was going to wipe the Israeli entity out for good. He moved his troops up to the southern border of Israel. He demanded that the UN that separated Egypt from Israel withdraw their troops. He also shut off the Straits of Tehran, which were international waters. That was 
an act of war. And so that's what caused the War of 1967. Well, when it broke out, Israel defeated all of her enemies in six days. I mean, it was breathtaking. The whole world was stunned. Six days? Israel swept all the way to the Jordan River, took the Golan Heights, uh, and in taking the Golan Heights, of course, moved way up on the, the hill and established a new border with Syria, and then swung all the way in the south, all the way through the Sinai Desert. So it was a stunning victory, and actually, it restored most, not all, but most of the Promised Land to the possession of Israel. Now, here's where Israel started making their horrible mistakes. Well, the first mistake, and this is what Mahmoud Abbas is saying, this came out in the Haaretz newspaper in Israel the 28th of October. Uh, he said, we made a mistake. We should have accepted the partition plan because we're going to end up getting less back now, uh, even if we go to 67 borders, than we would have gotten then. Uh, then he went on to say, uh, this was in an interview with Channel 2 Television in Israel, actually. It was our mistake. It was an Arab mistake as a whole. But do they, the Israelis, punish us for this mistake for 64 years? Of course, he's saying that they need to withdraw to 67 borders. He would like for them to withdraw to the 47 lines as they were established by the UN, but that's not going to happen. Okay, well, I'm going very, very fast here. I hope that you're following what I'm saying to you. But then when the war stopped in 1967, the borders ended up where they are today, except for Egypt. When uh, Mr. Sadat came to Jerusalem to make peace with Israel, Israel gave Egypt back every inch of what she had captured in the 67 war, setting the precedent that most of the Arabs could expect to get their land back if they would make peace. Uh, as a matter of fact, shortly after the 67 uh, ceasefire was declared, Israel offered to go back to 67 borders if the uh, Muslim and the Arab territories around her would make peace. And that's when the Arabs had their famous conference at Khartoum, and they issued the famous three no's. Uh, no peace, no negotiations, and, uh, well, there's one other no there, no recognition of the nation of Israel's right to exist. So those were the three famous no's that have never been renounced from that time until this. Okay, let's get to the point here, though. So we have been wrestling with this problem from then on. We had the 73 war you know, in which the Arabs regained some honor, even though they were finally driven back. But yet uh, Israel teetered on the brink of defeat for a while, and then we fought back and forth. However, the 67 borders now have basically held. Now under negotiation, Israel is agreeing to withdraw from some of those borders, and the peace negotiations have been ongoing now, off and on, ever since 1967. We're talking about, what, 50 uh, years here. So it's been going on and on and on until it brings us to where we are today. Now let's pause just one moment and let's remind ourselves as to what the prophecy is. The prophecy states that when there's a peace agreement in Israel between Israelis and Palestinians, that if that peace agreement establishes final borders putting Judea under Palestinian control, and if it establishes a sharing arrangement on the Temple Mount and places the supervision of that under international control. If those two conditions are met, then that appears to satisfy the terms of a prophecy called the confirmation of the covenant. And the Bible says when the confirmation of the covenant takes place, that triggers the final seven years to Armageddon. Now stop, stop holding your tracks right here. Did anybody hear what I just said? When they get this peace agreement that they're trying to get right now, when they get that, it pulls the trigger on the time clock of God for the beginning of the final seven years to the Battle of Armageddon and the Second Coming, because it's at Armageddon that the Second Coming occurs. Now, it's so interesting that the international community, the quartet, which is charged with trying to get peace in the Middle East, they issued a call on September the 23rd of this year for there to be a final agreement in place by December of 2012. Now, if what they are demanding actually happens, then it looks like to me, from my understanding of Scripture, that the final seven years would begin in 2012. Now, remember, 
don't forget this. I'm saying if. If they get this deal, that they're, if they get a deal that puts Judea under Palestinian control, which everybody believes the peace deal when it's struck, that will be one of the conditions, that the area called the West Bank will become the homeland to the Palestinians, maybe with a few land swaps, but basically that's it, number one. And number two, if they solve the Temple Mount dispute by putting it under international control with both Jews and Arabs being able to worship freely there. If those two conditions are met, according to my understanding of the prophecy, if those things happen, then that will be the confirmation of the covenant that marks the beginning of the final seven years to Armageddon. So that's the reason when Mahmoud Abbas comes out and says, you know, we made a huge mistake back in 1947. We should have have accepted the UN deal at the time, we would have been better off. But the key is they did not accept it. They rejected it. And so for them to go back and try to claim something that they rejected and launched a war over, over and caused Israel to fight for her survival, and ultimately Israel did win. Now, of course, Israel has built an entire country. They're a beautiful country. So for them to try to go back and, and Roll back the clock. Who wouldn't like to be able to do that in our lives? Roll back the clock and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that decision back and put another one in its place. All of us would like to do that at one time or another. Nevertheless, uh, that's where we are right now. Now, Abbas also contended that he and former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert were very, very close to reaching a peace agreement in 2008 before the Israeli leader left office under a cloud of of corruption allegations. Now remember that statement because the memoirs of Condoleezza Rice were released today and she says the very same thing. Only she gives us some information that a boss decided not to give to us. She gives us information that Ehud Olmert put a deal on the table that a boss should have accepted and he walked away from it. So the Palestinians had a chance for peace uh, actually, Condoleezza Rice says in her article, perhaps I'll read some of it to you in the next segment, uh, but she says in her memoirs that Omerit actually offered to divide Jerusalem, to make it two capitals, to have, uh, actually he didn't want to divide Jerusalem, he just wanted it to be two capitals. He wanted an Israeli to be mayor, he wanted a Palestinian to be uh, deputy mayor, and he wanted to put the Temple Mount under a sharing arrangement, just like the Bible says it's going to happen. I'm going to tell you more details about this. This is so interesting, the things that are breaking today. We'll be back in just a moment. 